And it was very interesting to me then that here and in other cities that had experienced civil unrest, there were there was one political figure who I will not name <laughs> at this juncture mm-hmm. <laughs> from another city. Uh, and when I was trying to arrange interviews with this person about the civil unrest in his city, his representative said he won't talk about it, and if you bring it up, he'll walk out. Really? Which, they, which, which frankly, is never going to happen. I mean, people yeah. generally aren't going to do that. But yeah. sometimes, but the fact that there was this vehemence about not talking about it, I found strange mm-hmm. and noteworthy. Yeah, yeah. And I don't find that now. And I wonder if it's the passage of time. Is there something about the 50th anniversary that allows people to release whatever delusions or preconceptions or whatever that they had about it? And I still find sort of interesting some very interesting differences of opinion some minimizing obviously there it's a fascinating you can't find anybody who knew a racist here you can't find you can't find anybody who ever grew up in a racist household you don't know anybody whose parents ever uttered a racial slur right, right. you don't know anybody who you know you know that part i still find fascinating yeah. but i also the do bearing feel of this, reality yeah i mean i i've talked to one person so far who's willing to acknowledge the the obvious yeah yeah. Um, but I, on a personal level, and mm-hmm. yet I do find that in a lot of other quarters, there is a, there's a willingness, I think, on something about this 50th is different than the 40th, I so, think. Do you agree? I, I, I do. It is very different. And, and the level of debate and discussion about the, the 50th has been completely different than it was for the 40th. I don't even remember the 30th. Uh, or the twentieth being being marked in any any significant way, but I was of course much younger uh, for those, and and I may have have missed it. I, I wonder though whether one of the things that has changed is the national context in which this happens. I mean, think about the things that we are more willing to talk about, even if we're fighting about it uh, right now, in terms of race and racial history, racial tension, the attention that uh, that. Uh, racist incidents are getting. Now, we're in a different space in America, and I wonder if that maybe has made us different here in Detroit as well. I, 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 well, first, the larger context can't help but influence how people feel and, and view things. But it, I still, I, I have to tell you, I don't, I don't, I don't know yeah. why. I don't yeah. know why. Because on the one hand, while it is true that people have talked about a lot of things that they, these days that they didn't used to talk about, like I'm fascinated by what the reception will be for Catherine Bigelow's new film, sure. which is I think premiering here, Detroit. Her new film premiering. It's a searing, searing, um, deeply disturbing account of an event that is true. Yes. And I certainly, of course, a lot of people here knew that it was true, but it's also the kind of thing that you don't want to think about if you don't have to. So I'll be really interested to see how people respond to the film, not also as an artistic endeavor, but also as a recounting of events that everybody sort of knows is true. So on the one hand, you have a willingness to look at something that's deeply painful like that. On the mm-hmm. other hand, you also we are also in a moment where people are denying basic facts of reality. Right, right. That's right. People are denying basic facts of reality. And, and this is an and everyday not just, occurrence. Not just, not, not just in terms yeah, of uh, and, and, the 67 and, and uprising. And also the, the, the historical realities and, uh, that, that attend to those facts, sure. those actual facts. And so that's why I, I, you know, I didn't know what I was going to find when we came. I didn't know how people were going to respond to it. And it's been really interesting. And maybe it is something about the passage of time. There are a lot of painful historical episodes that people didn't want to talk about until they did want to talk right. about them. They're ready. So we'll, so we'll, you know, we'll see. But I, I have found it to be a really moving reporting experience. And I'm really glad that we were able to, to come. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we're adding some value and also just sharing the story with the rest of the country, the people who do uh, listen to our program and the rest of the country. Yeah. So. Uh, this is Detroit Today on 1019 WDET. I'm Stephen Henderson. My guest is Michelle Martin. She is the weekend host of NPR's All Things Considered. They are broadcasting live from here at the WDET studios in Detroit tomorrow and Sunday at 5 in recognition of the 50th anniversary of the 1967 uprising here in the city. If you want to call and join the conversation, talk about uh, your remembrances of 1967. Talk about media coverage of the 1967 uprising. We're starting to sort of see the gear up of uh, substantial media coverage of this anniversary. Uh, give us a call. 313-577-1019 is the number on the phones. That's 
1019. You can also go to the WDET Facebook page, put your comments there, or go to Twitter and hashtag Detroit Today. Can I say something yeah. about the media coverage, speaking of which, something that I learned from your coverage, uh-huh. the, the, the book that you put together yeah. with the consortium of reporters. Uh, the, the, the Detroit the, Journalism Cooperative. The jo- yeah. Detroit Journalism Cooperative is that one of the people I interviewed mentioned that there had been a media blackout on the first day. That's absolutely and right. And I, I, I thought I misheard him. I mean, honestly, I thought I misheard him. It's unimaginable like, now. And then I went back and looked at your reporting and saw that the, the that that was in fact true. And mm-hmm. I, you know, I was amazed by that. That was just one of the little nuggets that uh, that we that we sort of encountered sure. in being here and, and doing this reporting. Because at first, I didn't think that that's what I was hearing. But right. then to find out that people actually would do that and just would sort of all collectively decide we're not going to talk about we're the not obvious talk about when you see the smoke rising when right. people knew that that I, I wish i could kind of go back and unpack like why you thought that that was an okay thing to do but there are so many things that people thought were yeah. okay and to it do. was alternative media <laughs> yeah. black media uh who who sort of countered that and and in that first 24 hours made sure people knew what was what was going on which i think typically is the role that that alternative media uh, tends to play. But it is fascinating to me that they were trying to sort of deny, how do you deny the truth of your eyes? <laughs> right, and right. yet And yet, but that says <laughs> yeah, something, isn't it? Yeah, there's smoke, but there's nothing happening. But about our willingness to to not talk about certain things. I guess there's a, there's a lesson there. There's something cautionary there about that because I think a lot of us who are in sort of legacy media at the moment are just disturbed and infuriated by, you know, alternate outlets that are creating a reality that we don't recognize yeah. and many of us think is just outright lies or right. false or certainly leading people down a path that is not going to be constructive in the long run when they are confronted with the realities. So there is something cautionary to understand that a lot of our heritage organizations actually were willing to ignore sure. a major news event. And there is a lot of, there is a lot of that uh, in our history in, in mainstream media. Mm-hmm. One of the things that uh, that that I think we haven't talked enough about in mainstream media is the role that we played in historical oppression, historical inequality. Uh, mainstream media has a very ha played a very important role in all of those things, and we don't hear a lot of accounting about that, uh, and that's something that probably ought to change. Uh, one more question about uh, 67 before we move on to some other subjects. Detroit is celebrating its 50th this weekend. Newark celebrated its, well, not celebrated, but remembered its 50th uh, two weeks ago. There are several other cities, you know, between 1965 and 1969. This happens in many American cities. Why why Detroit? Why did you choose Detroit of all of the places you could have you could have been in Newark uh, instead. What was it about us? Well, the numbers aren't the whole story, but the numbers are a big part of the story. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact that, that you know, 43 people died, the fact that, what, four or five hundred people were yes. injured that that are acknowledged, the fact that 7,000 people were arrested, the fact that thousands of buildings were burned or looted. I mean, the costliest, you know, civil uprising uh, in the country's history. Mm-hmm. I mean, the numbers are, are part of it. It's also a confluence of things, too. I mean, the fact that there is this We've been here several times, as you know, in mm-hmm. recent years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been here several times in recent years with, with different teams sure. working on the programs that you were nice enough to mention mm. to report on all the things that are happening in Detroit. And one of the things that, like the last time we were here, for example, we did a really fun program, a live event, uh, that we talked about, you know, doers and makers, you know, people, you know, the food scene, the fashion <laughs> scene, the art scene, the culture scene. And a lot of the things that it occurred to us that all these stories that we've been reporting on here all these years, a lot of them are traceable to the riots. Yes. I mean, why are there urban farms? In part because there's vacant land. Why is there vacant land? Because there are buildings that were burned that were never replaced. The economic uh, crisis that the city has is emerging from, you know, what's that about? Yes. So it just occurred to us that all of the, the, a lot of the stories that we've been covering over the years, the roots of them, the tendrils yeah. are connected to this this event. So that was that's a certainly one reason. It's also I think that, you know, Detroit looms so large in our consciousness as a you know country. I mean Motown is no joke. I mean <laughs> the fact of you know our sense of who we are culturally you know, the automobile industry and its connection to all of our lives. I mean the fact is everybody didn't work in the auto industry, but everybody knows somebody who did. Yeah. It's just so many so many things and I think that it just 
and, and also, just to be honest, from talking about the way the news media operates, is that, you know, the fact that these events happen on the weekend and we consider the weekend to be our responsibility, like what happens on the weekends is our is our yes. responsibility. So that was a, a major reason for coming here. Yeah. And also to see you, Stephen. Yeah, well, I mean, well, I mean, it goes without saying. That's always right? a goes sort saying. of draw, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the phones here. Linda and Algonac, welcome to Detroit Today. Hello. Hey, Linda. How are you? Hi. Uh-huh. Hi. Um, my original call was for health care, but I, I can just wrap it all up together in the same problem. Um, this country has become one of unmitigated greed and capitalism, unbridled, and therefore the underprivileged people will suffer the most. The oligarchs of this nation are grabbing everything they can, and that's why we can't have like a single-payer health care like other countries. The richest country in the world should be able to give health care to everyone. People shouldn't be starving while others are living high on the hog on other people's slave labor wages. I mean, it's all encompassing. And a lot of it's for the, you know, people of color. That That is, I see that problem constantly. And then to have people that are younger pay more, I mean, pay less, and older people, well, John McCain got a tumor, but I know many young people who get tumors and accidents and tragic things happen to them. I mean, you can't separate it from the rich and the poor, and you can't separate it from the old and the young necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. And the more underprivileged you are, um, they just keep trotting down on these people. And I I don't know what the answer is because there, it seems like this whole country has been encompassed in greed. Yeah, uh, Linda, I, I certainly empathize with a lot of the things that you're that you're saying there, and and I'd ask myself the same thing, Michelle. I wonder whether you think the things that we're seeing now, the economic inequality, uh, the, the the continued racial tension, is it unprecedented? I mean, we always use that word uh, in in media and i always think it's a little dangerous because oh no it's certainly not unprecedented know. yeah no i mean this no, is no it's certainly not unprecedented i mean there's sort of very you know you look at some of the monumental structures in many of these cities and those were the opportunity to amass that kind of wealth was available to the very few and and the very few amassed a very great deal of it. So that is, this is certainly not unprecedented. I think what is different is our ability to discuss it in a way that did not exist, that people are, are, uh, even people of very limited means have access to information that they did not have. And I think that it's something that, um, I mean, there's a reason why sort of even our structure of government is was designed, as, as I think people know, to advantage the, certain uh, countries, certain parts of the country at the at the expense, at the expense of another, of to give them sort of disproportionate influence over national affairs. I mean, that goes those, those are the foundational I, documents of the United States. I would States say, you so, know, I hear so, from no. people all the time mm-hmm. on this show who want to dispute that. But <laughs> well, how could that be possible? I mean, our Constitution ba- <laughs> assigned certain people to three fifths of their humanity right. at the same time as it asserted the equality of all persons. Mm-hmm. I mean, this isn't to, you know, mm-hmm. This isn't to sort of set up sort of an ongoing centuries-long sort of grievance party. That's right. not the point. The point is to acknowledge the truth of it, yes. the truth yeah. of it. And yeah. so, you know, our systems have worked well for many things, but they have not worked well in redressing inequalities that were baked into it from the beginning. That's right. We've so, been really bad about that. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come okay. back, we're going to continue our conversation with Michelle Martin and hashtag uh, Detroit today, uh, Michelle. I said in the in the intro for you that uh, you had uh, that you launched. Tell me more in 2006, and that show ended. I think a couple years ago. Um, I, I have to say, it was it was one of my favorite shows, not just on NPR but on all of radio. And, Thank you for that. It was it, one of my favorites I too. Thought it was. Well, I'm sure it was right. Uh, and I thought it was very bold in the way that it challenged listeners to think about the things that are around them every day that touch on race and inequality, but that they maybe don't understand or recognize or even want to acknowledge. And I'll say this, since that show is no longer on the air, I don't know that on a national level we have we have gotten anyone to sort of pick up that space. I feel like 
that's a chasm now that exists on the airwaves. Well, I think that somebody who I think is coming close in a way is W. Kamau Bell uh, on yes, CNN. Sure. I mean, he had a program earlier on FX that was canceled that was a talk show similar uh-huh. to mm-hmm. to, the, to mine. And then I thought that Larry Wilmore on his late program, his uh, late, late show on Comedy Central was, was similar. Was and I, was, I found his sensibilities very similar. I, I liked him a lot because he was also a, had a man of, of some years on him, like I do, and yeah. <laughs> and and I felt that that was important because I felt that I think a lot of times we sort of pretend that you know all conversations are new, nothing's ever been heard of before, it's never been talked about, it's all new, and and you have a certain credibility when you've been around for a little bit and you've covered some things sure. and you had some conversations and you're not afraid of things and it's all you're not like shocked by everything, right? right? I mean, right. there's a reason why a lot of people come and ask you like for advice, right? Because you. <laughs> Because they think you might have some. See the gray hair? And yeah. Like, yeah. So I don't have any gray hair. <laughs> I, just to let you know, me. I don't have any. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> and I'm going to make sure I don't. But, <laughs> but I'm just saying that I think that, that there are people, and I, I, I think W. Kamau Bell is doing some, some interesting work, but it is interesting to me that he's a comedian yes. and not a journalist. Yes. I mean, I think his work is journalistic in the sense that he goes, he asks questions, he listens to people. Um, and I, you know, I respect him as a thinker, uh-huh. but he's not a journalist. And it just, I don't know, there's something that does bum me out about it. I have to be honest that, that, that it's like comedians are the people who are somehow empowered to do this, that to do that That's kind of work. That's an interesting observation. Yeah. I haven't thought of it yeah. that way, yeah. that, that we don't have in the journalistic sort of yeah, uh, Trevor media. Noah, yeah. Trevor Noah. And before him, John Stewart. And, uh, you know, I think they, they do some. I should, you know, bring him up to, you know, the. I think they're doing a lot of those conversations, and John Stewart was doing some, and it was interesting that there were some interesting, you know, racial dynamics on John Stewart's show yes. that came out as yes. the, the show was concluding. That, uh-huh. you, you know, but it's interesting to me that comedians are really, in my view, owning that space. Yeah, yeah, that's mm-hmm. different. Let's go to Malcolm in Detroit. Malcolm, welcome to Detroit today. Hey, uh, good morning to you both, hey. to my favorite people in radio. Hey. Glad to hear your voices. That's very nice. Of uh, to I say. definitely miss t- Tell Me More also. So my question is with uh, the Detroit movie coming out by Catherine Bigelow as well as the 12th and Claremont documentary, just two very different art pieces that uh, speak to what happened in 67. Just wondered, cause it sounds like you've seen Detroit, Michelle. I'm just wondering if you've seen 12th and Claremont and just uh, either of you can just comment on just both of those pieces of art from different aspects of what happened in 67 mm-hmm. and how might that um, help people understand? Because for some, that's going to be their only um, exposure or um, access to the conversation um, is, is watching those two pieces of, of, of work. Yeah. Uh, great, great question, Malcolm. I, I don't know if you've seen 12th and Claremont. I have not. I'm okay. hoping to see it before I yeah. go. Before, but you have um, seen Detroit. I have seen okay. Detroit. So I've seen, seen Detroit. 12th and Claremont. I have not yet seen Detroit. So between the two of us, we may be able to, to couple, like, uh, uh, talk about what uh, Detroit, the this this fictionalized uh, account of of something that actually happened well really, it's really fictionalized but from my understanding of the reporting it is very much rooted in fact and um i think it's going to be a hard watch for people i think if people plan on taking their children they they might consider watching it first themselves uh-huh. to be sure that, is that it right? is appropriate yeah. we went with our our entire team that came here from to that came out here to put on our programs this weekend and i can tell you that um Nobody talked on the way back from the screening. Wow. Uh, everybody had to take a minute, to, several minutes to process. I can tell you that one of the, uh, my particularly film-savvy staffers said, that's a horror movie, and you're trapped, and wow. you can't get out. And I thought that was very insightful. It's like, it, 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 if in the sense of, you know, I'm trapped and I can't get out. And I think that that works both as a factual depiction and as a metaphor for this sense of understanding all of the things that happen. I will say that um, if you you if you're familiar with Catherine Bigelow's style, you know from sure. the Hurt Locker and Zero Dark Thirty, that she kind of her signature is taking you there, where you really feel like you're in it, you're with the people who are in it. And I'm not sure everybody. I'm not a film critic. Okay, yeah. I don't do I don't do reviews. I, I you know I, my conversations with people are, and we will be speaking with her for our Sunday program. Just so you know, as well as Algie Smith, one of the stars of the film. Uh-huh. So we'll be speaking with her for our Sunday program. Is that to tell you that um, it's very intense, and I'm not sure that is that's why I'm interested to see how people react to it. But are you really really to sit to think about that? Yes. Are you really willing to go through that and sit there and put yourself in that place? Yeah. And with, 
you know, and, and uh, who's your hero? That's the question is, do people need a hero and do, who's the hero that they that they want? And that's why I will be really interested to, to see the reaction yeah. when the film comes. Yeah, out. I, I am eagerly anticipating seeing that that film. Twelfth and Claremont is really different from that uh, in that it is it was the result of a call out to people in Metro Detroit for footage that they had uh, in their basements or wherever from 1967 or the late 1960s here in Detroit. And it is at once a sort of nostalgic piece, but also then, of course, conveys the sadness and the anger and the frustration with what happened in July of of 1967. But it does it through the narrative of people who not only were there, but now have photographic uh, evidence of, of having been there. There's not a lot of footage of the of the uprising that we haven't seen before in it but there is tons of footage of the city and what the city was like and what the neighborhoods were like at the time and one of the things that struck me is just how different it looked uh this was a really different place and i wasn't alive in 1967 uh, but i was born just a few years later and i can remember how different the city was uh as well uh, i think if if the two films have anything in common it's probably again this this ask of the viewer to really to really be open to 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 confronting some of those difficult questions uh you know 12th and claremont deals with the change in detroit neighborhoods from white to black and what that looked like and what the reaction to that was in advance of the uprising it deals with the police brutality issue and it doesn't in a different way, obviously, than, than Detroit, but well, they're all there. One of the things that d- I think that the Detroit film ponders, and this is where I will, again, be really interested to hear how people feel about this, is a lot of these other incidents of police brutality that have been in the news in recent years happen in a split second. It's yes. like it was a couple – it was a, it was a, it was an encounter that happened quickly. Decisions were made quickly, and – the the defense is well you know what would you have done in my place mm-hmm. or i only had like a couple of seconds to think about to react i was reacting and as we see the juries have been very sympathetic to that argument as they traditionally have been very sympathetic to sure. law enforcement in this country I going was back to the re- going back to the revolution you know when you know john Adams successfully defended the british soldiers who fired on on the pra- right. on on the tea party you know, protesters, and I'm not. I'm not talking about in 2010. I'm talking about back in the 18th century. <laughs> the actual so Tea Party. The actual Tea Party. So people have been very, in this country, juries have been very sympathetic to people in law enforcement who were acting in the course of their jobs in a split second situation. That's different. Yes. That Detroit tells the story of something that unfolded over hours. Yes. And then the question that people have to ask themselves is why, over the course of hours. Were those decisions made? Did people behave in that way? And I think that that's something that's, that's going to be really hard for people to ask themselves to yeah. to think about. Because yeah. so 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 we'll see. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I can't wait. Like I said, I can't wait to see it. Okay, Michelle Martin, weekend host of NPR's mm-hmm. All Things Considered, broadcasting live from WDET studios tomorrow and Sunday at five and remembrance of the 1967 uprising. Thank you for being here on Detroit Today. Thank you for having us. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, that'll do it for me this week. I'll be back on Monday. Detroit Today is produced by Laura Weber Davis and Jake Neer. Program director is Joan Isabella. Technical director and engineer is Matthew Trevethan. And our associate producers are Addie Wallace and Jennifer Pruss. Detroit Today's theme song was con- composed by WDET Sam Bobian. This is 1019 WDET, Detroit's public radio station, a community service of Wayne State University. We'll see you next week.